my, name? Yeah, my name is Robert Morning, and I'm a World War II veteran, Navy veteran, who enlisted very late and uh, was in training during the last part of the war. Finally got to, to sea in uh, December of 45 and was assigned to the USS Roosevelt in, in January of 46, early January. Uh, I served on the Roosevelt as a radioman, uh, first class seaman radioman, striker they would call it that in those days. Eventually making a third class radioman a promotion and uh, a non-commissioned officer rating in the Navy, which is third class petty officer. Uh, I uh, uh, stayed on Roosevelt for most of 46, uh, making third class. At one time, we had a new uh, man come on board, a readyman first class, sometime in mid of 46, I believe, or thereabouts. And his name was McDowell or McDonald. At any rate, we call him Mac. And Mac uh, had come on board as assigned, and uh, my chief petty officer told me to show him the ship, and I did. I showed him the ship, uh, show, show him where we bunked and all those details, brought him back to Radio 1, and introduced him to our CO, who, who was Commander Kramer, a full commander, who uh, was uh, in charge of the CR division of the USS Roosevelt Communications Division, including signalmen and radiomen. And uh, uh, I introduced him to Commander Kramer, and I said, Commander, this is Raymond First Class McDowell. He he's, he's just coming on board, coming on board, and he's a new, new man. And they shook hands. And, uh, Kramer asked him, what, what have you been on? And he named four aircraft carriers, all of which had been sunk underneath him. Well, Commander Kramer and I looked at each other and shook our heads. We just couldn't get over this, the fact that this man had survived four carrier sinkings. And uh, we were both amazed and surprised. And later on, they published the whole story in the ship's newspaper which was very interesting. I don't have a copy of that. Uh, Commander Kramer, by the way, was, uh, the buzz in the radio shack was that he had worked the code room in Washington with another individual or individuals, I should say. But we didn't think much of that because we heard these stories and rumors all, quite a bit. Uh, years later, when I saw the movie Tora, 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 uh, Commander Kramer was, was in the movie and it turned out that he was at that time working the code room in Washington in the movie with the colonel, army colonel, signal corps man maybe. And what had happened was the, the, the two groups had broken the Japanese diplomatic code, code purple, and uh, had knowledge of the fact that the uh, communication from Japan to the embassy in Washington was that December 7th, no later than I think one o'clock or so thereabouts on December 7th, be sure that your, all your code books and your equipment is destroyed. Well, of course, Kramer knew that this was a very serious development and made an effort to communicate that to everybody he could, including the president, if he could, and the chief of naval operations, which was at that time Admiral Stark. He didn't gain access to Admiral Stark, and Stark uh, uh, heard the story with other officers present, and one officer mentioned, Admiral, I think with all respect, we should contact Pearl Harbor. And Stark reached for the phone, and hesitated and said, no, I better talk to the president first. He pulled back his arm and hand after he had reached for the phone to make the call. Well, that was just 
December 6th, before the next morning attack. And this is all depicted in the movie Torah, Torah, Torah. When I saw the movie, I said to myself, I know that man. I know that man, Commander Kramer. He was my CO. And I remembered the buzz in the radio shack was that he had broken the Japanese code. No, he had, he had worked the code room, I'm sorry. I didn't know the other, other development about the code breaking. But I knew that he'd worked the code room. And when I saw the movie, it turned out that he had helped break the Japanese diplomatic code, code purple. So it all, it all fit together. Well, that was Commander Kramer, a full commander at that time, a lieutenant commander at the time of Pearl Harbor. A fine officer, a Napa's man, and uh, this was all by way of background to the Pearl Harbor story depicted in Torah, Torah, Torah. And by the way, they did pick actors who resembled all of the characters involved in this period of time. The Japanese actors were picked to resemble the admirals involved on the Japanese side. Our actors were picked to resemble the men, the officers on our side. So the authenticity of the movie and the choice of characters was very, very close. And when I saw the movie, I couldn't get over the Commander Kramer person, the actor involved in portraying Commander Kramer. And it all came back. It all came back. The, the whole episode of Kramer being our CO and, and uh, the, the prelude to Pearl Harbor. Well, that's one of the stories. Later on, I went, we went into Dry Dock. We went to the Caribbean and we went to the uh, Mediterranean and later on in 46, we went into dry dock in Portsmouth, in uh, Virginia, Portsmouth, the naval shipyard. And I was, at that time, I applied for electronic tech school at Great Lakes and went back there for a year at least or more with leave. Came back to the ship at 48, came out of dry dock and was, was reassigned, of course, or returned to the, to the aircraft carrier that I had come off from to be trained as electronic tech. I came back, I was now age 20, and I was given charge of the main transmitters on the Roosevelt, where I had been a radioman. I was now uh, electronics tech in charge of the main transmitter radio two location. So this is now 48, and uh, I had heard from my mother and father we were gonna bring my brother back from the Philippines who had been killed in combat in around April of 45. They were gonna bring him back for re-interment, reburial. And so I contacted my CO and I said, uh, my brother's coming back. I would like to go back and be his escort. And my CO agreed and I went to, uh, he gave me, he sent a, we sent a wire to the Washington DC Bureau personnel. This is the copy we got back. If you wanna close up on that, you're welcome. This is the copy we got back from, from uh, NSS Washington. This is a, uh, from the main communication system in the Navy at that time. And it authorized me to go ahead and go, leave the ship and go back to Minnesota, to Chicago, by the way, first and uh, report into the uh, Army uh, uh, office, uh, American Graves Registration, uh, who was in charge of the office, and they were, uh, at that time, a huge warehouse, which had all of the boys coming back uh, in caskets uh, in this huge warehouse. And so I took this telegram, I left the ship under, under uh, permission with my commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant uh, no, Ensign Chandler at the time, as a Chandler, and he said, go. And so I went up, I left the ship, went up to Langley, Air Force, uh, wait a minute, 
Yeah, it's Langley, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. And we knew about Langley because Langley was a very cooperative agent, uh, base for hops, military hops. You could get a hop out of Langley any time they had ships, aircraft available. So I went to Langley with this document, my orders, and uh, uh, reported in to the, to the commanding officer. And he uh, said, okay, you will go over here and sleep here. You'll dine here and you report to the flight line tomorrow morning. And I did, and they issued me a parachute. And I went out from there to the, this aircraft that was on the line, and it was a B-25. And there were two pilots there. Well, I thought this was a routine flight and there would be other passengers. But as it turned out, I was the only passenger. Well, I didn't think much of that because at this point, uh, these people had to fly a certain amount of time to stay current and, and keep up their abilities. And I thought this was, this was a routine flight. Um, and I was just lucky to come upon this event. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the story on that. But anyhow, we left. I got in the B-25 nose. They, they greeted me. I gave them a salute, of course. And they said, you can be up here if you like. And I did. I went up on the nose and watched the whole world go by in a B-25. And I was the only passenger. Well, I didn't think much of that either at the time. But uh, we landed at, at Indianapolis, Indiana, Army Airfield, or Air Force Field at all, not Army, but Air Force, which came in in 47, by the way. And we landed there, and uh, I left the base, gave the boys a good salute, left my parachute in the B-25, and got off the base and got on the highway, stuck out my thumb. Along came a truck. And I told him I'm going to this address in Chicago to pick up my brother, 16 or something, 10 uh, Pershing Drive in Chicago. This is where the, uh, the boys were all brought back to, American Graves Registration Warehouse. So I went there and reported in and was then under Army orders. <laughs> A Navy guy under Army orders, which was okay as far as I'm concerned. And they told me my assignment, briefed me, gave me uh, a new order, by the way. Yeah, this time it was an Army order. And this is the Army order, which followed up on the Navy order. And I'll show you that real quick. But, but anyhow, the idea here is to, to verify all this with documentation, if you, if you will. But uh, this is the Army order here. It's going to be very hard to bring up, I think. So that was my orders to take my brother to Minnesota for reburial. You got it? Okay, and so we, they said, would you like to see where he is? Well, I was hesitant. A great big wall house with tall ceiling. I said, all right. So we went in and here was coffins stacked one on top of the other. And we walked through this corridor of coffins. And I think at that time, if I hadn't had it before, I developed an intense hatred of war. Intense. It's never left me. Never. In spite of all the sacrifice and heroism, it's an ugly business. And these are the, this is a cost. And the hatred of war, I think every veteran here or anywhere shares that. They should. I think most, of, if not all, do. So we got my brother on the night train out of Chicago to Minnesota. And I arrived early the next morning. My mother and father and brother were there at the station, Northwestern Station. We had, a, I think, either that type of steam engine, or I'm sure it was a steam engine. We arrived there early and he was transferred to a hearse. And I was home with my mother and dad and my brother and wife was the military escort for his reburial. American Legion came out with a full rifle salute, the usual thing, the fact folding, all of that. And that's, that's just about the end of uh, my 
two experiences that I wanted to com uh, communicate. Uh, I, I think uh, if I may commentary, make commentary on this, uh, I believe that Pearl Harbor may have been an avoidable situation had people responded to Kramer's uh, information. It would have come down a little different had we had we gone on more of an alert, but they had so many war alerts up to that time, they just ignored it. And besides, Saturday night's a big whoopee time in the Navy, and Sunday morning's a sleep <laughs> time, so that's, you have to factor that in. But that's the end of what I have to say. I don't have any more stories at this point. Thank you.